So I'm just going to double check. Do you see the title slide? Thank you, because I can't see the screens from here. Um, so there was a time uh, when we'd get a group of four or five people who knew the field in a big room like this at a national meeting of a uh, well-recognized medical organization. This happened several times. And the panel would outnumber the audience. Not anymore. And this, I think we all recognize, is one of the reasons why. You're looking at Aurora, Colorado, but this could be a photograph of any of the little pop-up Arlingtons for civilians that we now need to erect in, this, in, in our society. Public mass shootings are different. We all know that. They are the one form of firearm violence about which no one can tell a story that leaves themselves out. Whoever I am, whatever I look like, they happen to people just like me. Wherever I go in life, they happen in places just like the places I go to. They happen in places just like this place. Mandalay Bay is less than three miles from here. But we, we need to keep in mind that public mass shootings don't just account for well under 1% of all deaths from firearm violence. They don't even account for most mass shootings. What they are, among many other more important things, is a tool for mobilization. They're part of the reason that we're up here. They're part of the reason that you came to hear this talk. But it's our focus, as Dr. Cunningham mentioned, it, it's, our, it's our job to stay focused on the broader picture. So let's come back to all those people that David Satcher um, talked about. These are big numbers. I'm not going to read them off. You can see them faster than I can read them. I've got the real Arlington in the background, and that's to remind me to remind you all that in the 10-year period mentioned on this slide, or any 10-year period recently you care to designate, we have lost more civilians to firearm violence. I use homicide and suicide here. We all know the bullet doesn't give a damn whose finger's on the trigger. We have lost more civilians to firearm violence in the United States than we had combat fatalities in World War II. We have lost more civilians to firearm violence in the United States in the last 10 years than we had combat fatalities in all other conflicts in the nation's history, leaving World War II out this time, all other conflicts in the nation's history from the War of Independence to the present day. And as Dr. Cunningham uh, mentioned, it's really important for us as clinicians to remember that about 75% of those people die where they are shot. Doesn't matter how fast the ambulance gets there, doesn't matter how good the paramedics are, how good we are, how good the trauma docs, the ICU docs are, those people are just dead. And if we're going to make the greatest possible inroads into preventing mortality from firearm violence, we need to stop people from getting shot in the first place. Lightning Epi. This is a slide that you are familiar with even if you've never seen it. What leaps out is the remarkable concentration of risk for fatality from firearm violence among young men, particularly young African American men. We are looking here at death rates for violence, suicide and homicide put together for men in 2017. Almost 90% of deaths from firearm violence among African American men are homicides, so this is the homicide curve plus 10%. And as somebody who has done work not just as a researcher and a clinician, but as a policy person for almost 40 years now, I have to tell you it's uncomfortable, but we, it's along with that F word, it's something we need to be saying out loud. It has made a world of difference that in this case, the people at risk do not look like the people making the policy decisions. It's possible for policy, has been possible for policymakers to put distance, social dis distance, demographic distance, geographic distance, whatever kind of distance between themselves and the people at risk and say, it's not my problem. Medicine did that for a long time. We all collectively said, it's not our problem. I think we have awakened to the alternative reality of that. But let me point out that green line that sort of snakes off to the right, which um, shows you that beginning in the 50s, risk 
for firearm violence, mortality for fire, from firearm violence, is actually highest among white non-Hispanic males. Now, let me shift in the next slide from the risk-based approach to the burden-based approach. We all know that the majority of adverse health events from a given condition can occur in the low-risk population if the low-risk population is large enough. So rate's not so high, but watch what happens when I drop the denominator and we look at burden. That green line becomes much more prominent. What we learn is that beginning in the mid-30s, a majority of deaths occur among white non-Hispanic, excuse me, white non-Hispanic men, and that difference grows with time. Risk, burden. I can do it all day. And um, with a longer uh, talk, I, I spend a little bit more time on this, and then I just point out, huh, who knew that firearm violence was really also so much an old white guy problem? It's so nice not to be the first person talking about this. Um, uh, and um, I also want to acknowledge the NRA for that lovely graphic. Um, biggest favor anybody did for me last year was the NRA publishing that tweet. Um, for those of you who don't know the history of the tweet, we can, we can talk later. But <clears throat> as Dr. Cunningham said, it can start really simple. It can start right in the context of your practice. You have opportunities every shift you work to do something about this problem. When it's relevant, risk stratification makes a difference. When it's relevant, you can ask about firearms. You've got to do your homework so you know what to do with the answers, but you can ask. That's a matter of what I'm doing right now implicitly, and now I'm going to make it explicit, is I'm asking you to change your health behavior and start asking these questions when it's relevant. We all know about the um, power of making a public commitment to changing health behavior, so the Annals of Internal Medicine has actually provided a platform. You can navigate to this uh, commentary, which was written the week after the Las Vegas mass shooting. You can click on that little bit of hypertext, and you can join about 2,500 2,500 other physicians who have made a public commitment to take this up when it's relevant. And you can read some of the reasons why. It's um, pretty compelling reading. As Dr. Cunningham's organization has done, we've developed a pretty deep website. Um, I won't ask how many people in the room are familiar with firearms. I am. I used to shoot a lot. Um, it's just one of the things I've given up um, for lack of time. You don't have to be a shooter to engage in this conversation any more than you need to be a smoker to talk about tobacco. But you gotta know your stuff. And there are now a series of places where you can learn about, your, learn about that stuff. This website provides a deep set of links and a bunch of material right on the website. There is, a, again, on our website, a video. There are handouts for you. There are handouts for patients. But I want to talk a little bit. This is where um, Deb did kids. I was going to, I, I'm sorry, Rebecca did kids, and I was going to do adults and policy. I want to talk a little bit about that, that broader arena by addressing three of the policy issues that are topic A today. One is comprehensive background checks. Next to research funding, it's the thing that Congress is talking about the most. There is no question but that background checks, risk stratification, and verification of that, um, and denial of purchases by people who want to buy guns but are prohibited, work. There, we did a study 20 years ago, there have been a couple of others since, they reduce risk among the people directly affected by 25 to 30 percent. That's a pretty low NNT, it's an effective intervention. But at the population level, the results have been mixed, and the key question, and we've been working hard on this, and I think we've come up with answers, is that there are a series of design and implementation defects in background check programs, and in particular, in comprehensive, as I call it, background check programs, the ones that require uh, background checks for sales by private parties, such that it's been difficult to show a population level effect. There are actually nine of these defects. I submitted a manuscript that talks about all of them in exhaustive detail um, late last night. I'm going to mention just a couple of them. One is the data on which the background checks are run are really incomplete. 
At the time of the Virginia Tech mass shooting, uh, a case in which a man was prohibited, but his mental health prohibition had not been reported, so he passed a background check because the information was, was not in there, bought the gun that he used to shoot up Virginia Tech. At that time, only 22 out of 50 states sent any records of mental health prohibitions to the feds so that those records could be uh, part of the background check process. It remains the case today that about a third of felony convictions, felony conviction, and this is a good idea, trust me, felony conviction prohibits you from buying a gun. About a third of those do not exist in the data on which background checks are run. The Sutherland Springs mass shooter, the Charleston mass shooter, acquired their firearms, although they were prohibited people, because their prohibitions were not in the data. One other, I need to point out an error on the slide in that, in that third inset bullet, dropped the word required, that was an error on my part. But one of the crazy things about the federal background check process is if the check's not completed in three business days, you can get your gun anyway. About 4,000 times a year, people are found to be prohibited persons when the background check is completed after they have acquired their guns. And the cops have to go out and try and get those guns back, and they're not always successful. There are some design problems. I'm going to mention overly narrow denial criteria on the next slide, but let me include um, the fa failure to include private party transfers here. About 20%, 20 to 25% of the transfers that people are willing to talk about in response to a surveyor occur without a background check in the United States. And in most states, that's legal. I have, I, I do a lot of field work, and I have observed and photographed, I'm good with a hidden camera, photographed hundreds of these transactions. It takes less than a minute. Price is right, cash goes one way, gun goes the other, there's a handshake, there's always a handshake. There's no background check, there's no record keeping, that gun is just moving through commerce. Let's talk about some expansions of denial criteria. One is to prohibit people who've been convicted of violent misdemeanors. Under federal law, we have a prohibition for domestic violence misdemeanors. Um, so if I have an intimate partner, I punch her, um, I am pro and I'm convicted, I'm prohibited for life under federal law. Do the same thing to my next door neighbor, and in most states, I can buy all the guns I want, that conviction notwithstanding. Our work has shown that among people who legally purchase firearms, those who have one prior misdemeanor conviction on their rap sheet at the time of purchase are five times more likely to be arrested for violent crime in the future, including murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault. If they have two or more, that risk goes from fivefold to fifteenfold, and my comparison group here is law-abiding gun owners, people who at the time of firearm purchase have no criminal record. And I already mentioned that denying these people um, is an effective violence prevention strategy. Alcohol. Our work, um, we have a study out earlier this year, we have another one that's under review at the moment, has established, again, among people who legally purchase firearms, those with a prior conviction for a DUI are three to four times as likely as those with no prior criminal record to be arrested for a violent crime in the future. Who would have thought about it? Alcohol is a risk factor for violence, and firearm owners are just like everybody else. It's one of those duh studies, but you need the evidence. It's essential to the policymaking uh, process. Unfortunately, we don't have outcome data on denial. There's a bill before the California legislature based on our research results. I think that bill will be passed. I think we will have some outcome data to talk about. We don't have outcome data because the three states that have enforceable prohibitions either don't enforce them or don't keep data on which an outcome analysis could be conducted. I know that. I've asked them for the data. And finally, domestic violence restraining orders. Federal law has a domestic violence restraining order prohibition, but it's only for orders that come after a hearing, not for the emergency orders issued at the time when risk is highest. And oh, by the way, whether it's restraining orders or domestic violence um, convictions, the federal statute of domestic intimate partner violence does not include dating partners, does not include the boyfriend, or in a small minority of cases, the girlfriend, even though boyfriends are responsible for easily half of domestic violence fatalities in the United States. 
Lastly, extreme risk protection orders. I'm becoming a big fan of these. We all know the situation. Guys in the department, it's a guy usually, um, he's making some threats, but they're not criminal, we can't arrest him, he's not holdable for dangerousness to self or others on mental health grounds, but we all know something's gonna happen. We send those people out because there's nothing better, there's nothing to do. <clears throat> now in an increasing number of states, there is. Used most often to prevent suicide, but enacted in response to mass shootings is the emergency, the extreme risk protection order, we call them gun violence restraining orders in California. And the first two statutes, uh, statutes of this type had a somewhat different mechanism. They're called risk warrants um, and they're accessible only to law enforcement. But the idea is the same. But in Connecticut and Indiana, the states with the first laws of this type, the risk warrant laws, in California, in Florida, and in Vermont, these statutes were enacted in specifically in response to a mass shooting or a mass shooting that was thought to be imminent. That's Vermont. Their first order was served on a guy who'd been saying, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it for months. That order was um, uh, issued and served the day after the law was signed by that state's Republican governor. Um, there are some procedural details that, I, that you have had a chance to see. I won't repeat them out loud because I think we're short on time. Um, I will say this in California, we're doing an evaluation of this um, new policy. One of the things we're seeing is that these orders are being used to prevent, in an effort, to prevent mass shootings. Whether the issuance of the order and the recovery of the firearms, or in at least three cases, blocking the purchase of a firearm by somebody who'd been making a credible threat. Because we have a 10 day waiting period, guy makes a threat, guy buys a firearm, you've got 10 days, your honor, we have a problem, purchase gets blocked, is how it's worked three times now. I can't say that those orders caused those mass shootings not to happen, but we have a series that's approaching 20 and um, a, case, a case series now under review. Some of those stories are pretty compelling. Wait for the article. Thank you very much.